Well, I'm very pleased to welcome Lindsay here today. Lindsay and I worked together for about 18 months. We've worked out at Future Lab. We have about, gosh, seven, eight years ago, something like that. Might be slightly more. Might be. Yeah, but I was, I was also aware <laughs> of Lindsay's work before we actually worked together. So I hope that's a good recommendation. Um, right, I need to ask everybody to help themselves to refresh me if you haven't already done so. And please could you turn your phones to silence. The seminar is being live streamed for off-campus postgraduate students who can email any questions. We'll take questions at the end. It's usually better than Rebecca um, on her keyboard intermittently through it, which is a bit noisy, you said. Uh, this session will also be recorded and the recording will be available on the departmental website. Um, what we'll do first of all is everyone will introduce themselves so that you know who you're speaking to. So I'm Sue Grandma, I'm a lecturer in educational research. Do Daglish, Project Administrator in Educational Research. Uh, I'm Beth Suttle, I'm a senior teaching associate. I'm actually based in organisation work and technology in the management school. <laughs> but do bits of education stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Beth, I'm a fine arts student. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm Jo Waring and uh, I'm in educational research. Um, I'm Helen, student, educational research and social justice. Carolyn Jackson, educational research. Rebecca Martin, educational research. <laughs> now, I've immediately departed from script as I tend to, so I actually introduced you at the wrong point, but I think that's fine. Um, it's not so. That was part of my enthusiasm to talk to us today about anticipating educational futures through data and ethnography of the secondary school. So I'll hand over to you in a minute. I'm expecting you to talk about 40 minutes, so we'll start with being <coughs> frantically. Um, and then after that, we'll have a small break for um, refreshments and then some questions and comments. So, okay. Okay, brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, as, as it's quite a small group, I might I might just stay sitting down to speak. Is that okay with everyone? You can hear me at the back, all right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is um, some research that I did for my PhD, um, which was a critical account of how numbers were made um, in an English secondary school what those numbers did, um, how those numbers were made to matter, and for whom. So the question that was kind of driving my PhD was about how data practices, and I'll come on to what I mean by data practices in a bit, um, how they define and reconfigure the possibilities for thinking and doing education. So what I'm trying to get at here is that data does not just measure or describe something else, but that it plays an active role in shaping and reshaping um, what education is and can be when we think about education and how we might practice education. So my research was um, an on-the-ground ethnographic study um, tracing and tracking uh, what are called, well, what Evelyn Ruppert and others call the social life of data within a school. And that was uh, thought, I conceived of that as a complement to a lot of existing research mm -hmm. on data in education that looks at kind of discourses of data and kind of governmentality. But um, there was less, um, there is more now, but, but when I did the field work, there was less uh, looking at what actually happens in, in schools and, and on the ground in educational settings. But my talk for today is focusing on a particular aspect of that research, um, looking at how data performed multiple and actually sometimes conflicting educational futures within this setting. Okay, so all of this is in a context, um, as I'm sure lots of people in this room are very well aware of kind of intensifying educational data practices in this country and globally. Um, so we have data being used as a strong part of accountability systems at an international level, the PISA program that I'm sure you're all well aware of, um, ranking nations by, by the performance of students on standardized tests. 
down to a national and local level mm -hmm. where in England you'll see local newspapers as well as national newspapers producing rankings of individual schools in, in school league tables. And this is coupled with a move uh, in kind of technology, educational technology, to datification, caught up in a kind of big data hype um, where we're seeing kind of... Um, a, a promise that data is going to kind of solve and fix, you know, all the problems that you might encounter in a school. Um, so we're seeing uh, lots of platforms such as this, this one here is Arbor, but there are many others um, that promise to kind of give a real time uh, update on performance of a school. It's kind of a very business kind of model um, through various metrics that are tracked and presented in different ways. And uh, to uh, this screenshot from Class Dojo, which is uh, a, a gamified, datafied uh, platform for monitoring and uh, intervening in primary school children's uh, behaviour. It's a, it's a disciplinary mechanism um, based on surveillance um, in which children can earn dojo points uh, for displaying um, desired behaviours. So this can all be explained and has been approached through questions, uh, through, through discourses of governing and governance, governing by numbers, people like Jenny Oscar, um, working from kind of Nicholas Rowe's research, um, in which data has become part of a, uh, a, a decentralized, dispersed, networked forms of governance, so rather than kind of the very direct top-down governance processes of standardization, benchmarking, comparison, um, can be seen to act on policy and practice at international, national, institutional and individual levels. And in this way, rather than a uh, very uh, a directive approach to governance, schools are impelled to govern themselves through meeting uh, data metrics. And this raises questions about kind of which truths come to be told through data, which ways of knowing are legitimated through data. So how do we know about education? How do we know what education is? And I, I would argue this also shapes how we think about what education should be. Um, and it's commonplace to, to raise concerns about the datafication of education in terms of it, it being very reductive and I think it's worth just unpicking what we mean by reductive and thinking about why that matters. And I find um, Biesta, and I, I never know how to pronounce his first name. I don't know if anybody else Gert. knows. Gert. Is, it, is it Gert? Or yeah. it's Dutch, so I don't know if it's Hert, but <laughs> anyway. Um, but I find Biesta really helpful to kind of uh, think through um, what, what is at stake um, when we talk about kind of reductive... Uh, approaches to education through data you know and we, we might say well are we saying that what what counts in education is only that which can be counted and what Biesta says is that um, education if it is to be educational at all cannot be completely predictable that education must be open to new beginners so it must allow for the forming and the development of new subjectivities and new identities and for new beginnings, that is new knowledge to form and emerge in educational relationships in which the outcome cannot be predicted precisely or controlled. That he would argue that if it can be predicted and controlled at this kind of precise level, that it, it is nothing, it's not education, that we might be able to train somebody to perform a certain skill, but this is not really what we're talking about when we talk about education. So he argues that education must maintain this radical openness to unpredictability and the possibility of failure, that, that we must have the risk of failing that we do not know what will happen always through education, um, but that if we try to remove that risk, then, then we're not doing anything worthy of the name education. Um, and I think this is in kind of direct contrast to the kind of drives behind some of the, the database approaches that we're seeing, um, which do seem to kind of manage risk at an increasingly precise level and control the future. Um, that, that's a lot of the drives behind, behind how we're seeing data in schools, is trying to control the unpredictable. 
Um, so my approach <coughs> to trying to understand how this played out in, in a school um, was to take a kind of socio-material approach to understanding data where um, they're thinking about data practices. Um, so what I mean by that, I mean, uh, perhaps I'll backtrack. So when I started this project, I was interested in data technologies. Okay, because my background is education and technology. So I started looking at the platforms and tools and technologies, but increasingly that just didn't make sense to kind of separate out the technology from everything else that was going on around it. So instead I started to talk about data practices as containing the technologies and the tools and the materials. And some of this was really high end kind of new innovative technologies. And some of this was spreadsheets and people printing stuff on bits of paper and cutting it out with scissors. Um, but the, the social practices are kind of all bound up, that, that we cannot separate the material and the discursive when we're talking about how data works. So to develop this idea, I, I used um, Karen Barad's idea of um, an apparatus of knowledge. So without going kind of too far into a kind of theoretical cul-de-sac here, um, her, her argument is that, and, uh, and drawing on kind of quantum physics, is that the apparatus by which we know something shapes what that thing is. So the conditions by which we measure or observe or know um, actually produce or perform what that thing is. So she's, she's working from quantum physics where, depending on what experimental equipment um, is being used at any one time, um, a, a light may may be either a particle or a wave okay so and and she then extrapolates that and says that is not just relevant to quantum physics that is relevant to all of social and material life so we have to think about the socio-material conditions that make knowledge possible so in education and in schools i think we can see that these data practices are making some kinds of knowledge possible Okay, so I'm not arguing that the knowledge is incorrect, but I'm arguing, well, how is this knowledge made possible through what, which social and material conditions? And it's worth saying that this, this apparatus is not, an, it's not an infrastructure. This is a process, and it's dynamic, and it changes. Um, so I have had um, some interesting discussions with uh, one of your colleagues um, in this department, Mary Hamilton, who was asking me if I could draw the apparatus. And, and I was kind of saying, well, I, I'm not sure I can because it's, it's continually in movement. And if I, if I were to draw it or try and represent it, then that seems to fix it in a way that perhaps doesn't quite do justice to this as a process. Um, OK. So going into my study, um, so I worked with um, a school, an English suburban secondary school. Um, this is here is the uh, data office in the school. As you can see, there's lots of very interesting things going on on the walls there. Um, and there's nothing particularly different or unusual about this school. They were, they were pretty keen on data, but other than that, there wasn't, you know, most schools are now. Um, but rather than try and represent this school as kind of a case that might be applied to other cases through virtue of being representative or, or otherwise, the way I was thinking about my research in this school was actually it was um, a moment of entry into kind of wider networks. So what I was seeing in this school actually showed me how different networks that extended beyond the school came together in this particular, in this particular moment. Um, so that while I was looking at quite specific uh, practices in a school, this was actually telling us about things that extended well beyond the boundaries of the school. That, they, that I mean, the physical, technological and data infrastructure for a start, that data literally flows in and out of the school um, through various technological um, channels. That there are, of course, kind of multiple accountability systems um, at work uh, shaping what happens, that we're in a dynamic policy making context um, where the school kind of trying to anticipate and respond to upcoming policy changes, as well as multiple media and technology discourses at work. And so what I did was to start in the data office, seeing the data office as an entry point, um, <coughs> and follow the data 
into and out of the data office, follow the practices by which data was made and came into the data office, what happened to it when it was there, how it was combined and recombined, how it was visualized, processed, turned into new forms and, and sent out of the data office to, to new places. And, and I, I worked over the period of a school year with kind of three intensive periods of, of data collection, um, observing what went on, doing interviews, taking photographs, um, and really just trying to kind of collect documents and see as much as I could in that time. Um, so the, in the data office, uh, there were three members of staff. There was uh, Sarah, these are all pseudonyms, um, Sarah was the Raising Standards Lead, she was the boss. Um, Chris, who was the Data Manager, um, and he was, uh, a, I think, a, a maths geek, a maths whiz, and a maths teacher. Um, Sarah was also a maths and science teacher. Um, Chris would have been very happy with the description of himself as a maths geek. This is not in any way <laughs> derogatory of, of Chris. Sarah drew this picture for me to describe part of the, the apparatus, she didn't use that word, but <laughs> I'm using that word, um, of how data worked within the school. And they had six data drops every year, so once per term, in the kind of new way that schools call their half terms terms. And um, so I won't go into this in a huge amount of detail, but um, from, from each department, um, they bring in data at the end, end of each term. That data then comes into the data office and is processed in various ways. And on the left, you can see a list of uh, various reports that come out um, from that data drop each term. Um, so there's a lot of work going on. But what I'm going to focus in on now is, um, you probably caught a glimpse of it in that picture of the data office, was, um, uh, I, I called it the pupil postcard wall, and this was one of the big displays in the data office, and um, it, it grabs my attention immediately because it was, it took up a lot of space, it was right next to the raising standards leads desk. It obviously was very important, you know, that by, by be, virtue of its position in the room. But I, I was also quite disconcerted by it because what we see here are photographs of children with bits of data marked next to their photographs, organised in these kind of columns and rows. Um, so, so I was kind of wow, what what is going on here? Um, and so speaking to the people in the data office about what this was, how it was made, what it did. Um, this postcard wall, it, it brought together, it articulated multiple sources of data from these data drops to both anticipate and intervene in pupils' educational futures. So what its core function was to, was to identify pupils who were, were at risk of missing targets for progress and attainment in English and maths. And it prioritised certain pupils to attend and receive interventions designed to improve their scores in those subjects. So I'm going to kind of dive into the postcard wall um, in some depth and to look at how it contained and produced different kinds of educational data futures. Um, so this, this bit gets a bit mathsy. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see this um, diagram up here, the, the, um, the grid uh, on the top left. Um, but this was uh, Sarah's, uh, she drew this for me to explain how the maths in the pupil postcard wall uh, worked. So what you can see in the first column is you can see, well, if you go along the top row, you can see the first thing says ENG for English and then MA for Maths and then PP for Pupil Premium. Within English, there are two headings, Attainment and Progress. Okay, so children, every child was given a score for both Attainment and Progress in English and Maths. And that score was out of 32. So 
the first column, what you might see, um, if you can see it closely enough, and apologies if, if you can't, um, you'll see a D with an arrow to a C and the number 32. So what that means is that if a pupil is forecast to achieve a D grade, um, that is one grade away from the, the school accountability target of a C, and they, they are therefore given a score of 32. If they are forecast an E, and that's two grades away, they're given a score of 16. Mm. Okay, so the further away from the threshold they are, the lower the score they receive. And it's a similar approach in the progress column. So if uh, their, their targets were to make three levels progress between the end of primary school and the end of secondary school, um, if they were only making two levels progress, they would get the top score of 32. And if they were making one level progress, they would get 16. So that was then repeated for maths. And if they were designated a pupil premium child, this means that they're in receipt of certain benefits, they're, they're deemed to be disadvantaged, um, they were given a top score of 32. All those numbers were then multiplied to give a number out of 32 to the power of 5. And then each child was ranked on the basis of that number from the top to the bottom. Um, so this, this algorithm, this homemade algorithm, um, was how it worked was to prioritise those pupils who were closest to meeting the thresholds. So if you were further away, if you were only predicted to get an F, if you were only making one level progress, you were a lower priority to receive interventions. Okay, so what Sarah said here was, you know, it's all about intervening with the right children. Okay, you know, this is quite a familiar process of triage. You know, who kind of, if you're familiar with kind of Gilborn and Udell, you know, this is a, um, this is a datafied version of of that triage process in which the school decides and I have to say I'm not you know the school are making very sensible decisions giving the context that they're in you know they're making very rational decisions um, that they are using this algorithm in order to identify where to best focus their resources for maximum impact on their accountability measures okay so okay so I think what we can see in the postcard wall um, is an anticipatory logic in which the school is tracking, predicting and intervening in both individual pupil performance and school level performance through data. But what is particularly interesting to me was that there were multiple educational data futures going on in this wall. There were the targets. Um, the minimum expected grades, these were the measures of progress which expressed what a pupil should get. And then there were the teacher forecasts which were a prediction of what they will get. And these were brought together within the postcard wall. Um, so it's that difference between what a, a, a target, the C for attainment or the three levels progress for progress um, and what the pupil was forecast um, that made that made the difference. So I think it's worth kind of going into what actually minimum expected grades were and there is a bit of a caveat here for anyone working in English education system now is that there is a different accountability system now don't have minimum expected grades anymore and schools are not measured on the threshold of uh, C, C to D, so the numbers of C and yeah. above. Uh, we now have progress eight and attainment eight, which is definitely an improvement on this system, but is still very subject to lots of gaming by schools. Um, but going into the minimum expected grades and how they worked here, um, they, the minimum expected grade was three levels progress from the end of key stage two tests to GCSE level. So that's from age 11 to age 16. And that would translate into if a pupil scored a level four at age 11 at key stage two, they would be expected to get a grade C at GCSE. And this was a core accountability measure um, for the school, the percentage of pupils making their minimum expected grades, i.e. 
three levels progress. The minimum expected grades were applied to GCSEs in all subjects, whereas Key Stage 2 only tests English and Maths. So those two were averaged in order to produce, English and Maths scores were averaged in order to produce a minimum expected grade for French history, geography, sports, etc. And there was also, I discovered, talking to teachers and doing my own research, no statistical, empirical or theoretical basis for the assumption that children should make three levels progress. So where this has come from seems to be something of a mystery. Um, I couldn't find anybody who could explain to me why three levels progress was deemed to be the expected amount. But nevertheless, there they were. And they extended everywhere in the school, not just in the postcard wall. So they produced pupil progress. Um, so in an English classroom, pupils would have to go to these colour-coded boxes and choose the sticker for their MEG and put it in their box books for every lesson, which had a, a kind of success criteria that they were expected to self-evaluate themselves against at the, end of, at the end of the lesson. Again, in the English classroom, uh, teachers showed me how they input data into the school's tracking systems, and when they put in pupils' current grades, current levels, the, the SIMS program would automatically colour code that number to show if the pupil was on track to reach their minimum expected grade. And the teachers did not know how this calculation was performed, how the software deemed whether a pupil was or wasn't on track, but they did know that they would have to explain the red. So once they input their data, if there was red for this pupil is not on track, they would have to explain that to their <laughs> head of department and then the head of department would have to explain it to the data office and to the senior leadership team. So it was both at a pupil level and a school accountability level that the heads of department um, received reports from back from the data office that gave names of pupils who were not on track and had to uh, indicate what they were going to do to change that. Um, and progress summary reports that were used amongst the senior leadership team uh, were produced from all this data um, and Chris in the data office described it to me as an early warning system um, and he, he was pointing to it and said because that's the thing that we get hammered for by Ofsted okay. and he was particularly looking at differential progress between pupil premium and non-pupil premium children that was one of the school's core, um, core goals. So, so this, this MEG that nobody knows where it has come from or why, why it exists in the first place was everywhere in the school expressing an idea of where each individual child should be by the time that they leave the school. So what kind of futures are we seeing in this data? Um, so I think we see MEGs as an idea of educational futures as steady progress very linear, it's very predictable. Okay. Now teachers questioned that when they talked privately to me. Um, they questioned whether the key stage two tests were reliable, they knew children were coached to pass them and that they might have performed better, you know, and that it was just a test on one day and how could it really summarise um, the future potential of that child. They also questioned it on developmental grounds, that children don't necessarily progress in a linear fashion, that they plateau and jump ahead and maybe fall back. But that didn't really matter, that, that conversation couldn't go anywhere because teachers were still required to act as if they were reasonable measures. And they were required to turn them into reasonable measures. They were required to make sure that as many children as possible did reach their MEGs. <coughs> so the second kind of data future coming into the, um, into the postcard wall was, this, uh, was the teacher forecast. Which, um, so we have the MEGs that are, are normative and we have the teacher forecasts that are predictive. So we've got what should happen and what teachers think will happen. Um, so the data office um, said to teachers that the forecast should be based on assessed performance data because that would be objective and minimise bias. And 
in practice, teachers included a lot more in their judgments when they were trying to predict what children would get in their GCSEs, um, including whether they thought that child was behaving well, anything that was going on at home, um, and also taking into account the possible effect of the forecast on the pupil's motivation. So some teachers would say, if I, if I, if I predict you a B, you're going to take your foot off the gas and you'll get complacent. So I'm not going to predict you a B, even though I think you probably will get one. So there was a lot going on in kind of how this data was made. But the data office were really upset about this, and they said, no, you just need to give them a test and read the data off the test, <laughs> um, because otherwise it's bias. So the data office were engaged in a, I don't want to say campaign, um, of sort of policing teachers predictions uh, and, and they were using data to try and check whether teachers predictions were or were not accurate. I think there's a, a whole kind of convoluted epistemological question about how you can be accurate about something that hasn't yet happened. Um, but what the data office were doing um, were developing these graphs uh, which are transition matrices where they plotted um, in, the, in the top one they plotted the pupils mock exam results against teachers forecasts to see if there was a correlation between the two. So the assumption being that teachers should be basing their forecasts on the mock exam results because that's the best available data. The second uh, transition matrix plots uh, the previous year's cohort, their mock exam results against their real results. And that gave the data office a pattern of conversion from one to the other from a previous cohort that they expected to see replicated in the teacher's forecasts for the current year. I think this is statistically questionable on all sorts of grounds. Um, including comparing different cohorts of pupils who may not be very similar. Um, and also, um, they didn't actually look at what I would have thought would have been the key one, which is the relationship between teachers' forecasts and final results for the previous year, because maybe teachers were actually more accurate than mock exams. We, they didn't have a look at that. Um, but I think what's, what's more important for my argument here is, is how we see data being mobilised in an attempt to try and bring certainty and predictability to people's futures in something that is inherently containing an element of uncertainty. There's a lot of anxiety, um, I think, around the data office about trying to predict the unpredictable. So what's going on when we bring these different data futures together? We bring the, the targets, the normative futures, the MEGs, a, together with the forecast and the predictions. The difference between these two is what really drives the, the engine of the algorithm um, that determines whether a pupil is eligible for intervention or not. But there were also other consequences too for teachers and for pupils. So for teachers, they were caught between two completely incompatible accountability uh, measures. They were both asked to accurately predict the future, what they think a child will get. Um, to, so, to, and they, they would be kind of measured. You know, have you have your forecasts, you know, been borne out? At the same time as being asked to change that future to ensure that pupils met their targets. So, teachers were in a bit of a lose-lose situation there. And by closing the gap between these two different futures. Pupils, um, pupils had various effects as well. Pupils were on, in receipt of kind of these interventions. So some pupils found themselves moved into booster classes for English and maths and usually taken out of arts or sports subjects, which were deemed not really very important. Um, and so their wider curriculum um, suffered as a result. But on the other side of that, pupils who were really struggling and weren't going to pass any of these thresholds didn't get any extra support. Okay, so, you know, there's two sides to that. Okay, so that was all in the pupil postcard wall, and I think we're starting to see these different data futures kind of bump up against each other. But I want to introduce now a third, a third data future here. Uh, which I'm calling probabilistic data futures. And this wasn't part of the postcard wall, but it was 
part of the data practices and the data apparatus within the school, but was less less systematized. So it, it, it came out at, at different points. So examples examples here would include um, software got a screenshot here which analysed the predicted pattern of uh, performance across the whole school split down by demographics and compared to national averages. And those aren't live national averages but those are previous <laughs> years national averages. So it's, it's an approach that looks at patterns in large data sets rather than trying to look at uh, determining performance of individual pupils. Um, the transition matrices that I just talked about um, a moment ago, again, are trying to show patterns of progress applied to different cohorts. And quite interestingly, the Data Office conducted their own analysis of a national data set um, where they showed that pupils with lower attainment on entry to the school were statistically far less likely to make three levels progress. So they were able to show that the idea of the future contained within the minimum expected grade was actually empirically unlikely, that expected is doing a lot of work here, you know, expected by whom? Um, because it certainly wasn't expected if you look at the actual data of children um, going through the system. And I think these probabilistic futures, working at the level of data set, have a little glimmer of hope to suggest that there is the possibility for more uncertainty and more variation um, if we think about the future in these kind of pattern-based and probabilistic terms. That because we're not having to say this child, this target, this forecast, we can we can talk about, you know, likely pictures at the level of cohorts that is slightly less reductive, is slightly less determining than this very kind of tightly focused um, data features. Um, and that it does allow a little bit of variance. I don't think by any means it solves all the problems, but I think it offers maybe some ways forward or around or alternatives to some of the more determining and reductive kind of data features that that I've talked about already. Um, but when they came back into contact with the forecasts and targets, new problems emerged. Um, and what we saw, what I saw here was this national data analysis. Um, it didn't matter that you could say, well, it's statistically unlikely that, you know, this person's going to make three levels progress. That still had to be translated back to the level of the individual in order for the school kind of data apparatus to function. Um, so the data manager, Chris, um, was a very interesting character. And so he had an understanding of, from probability of what what the overall pattern of his class uh, might look like, what, what kind of grades they would achieve as a pattern without necessarily identifying individuals. So he said, I've got a bunch of, I've got a bunch of pupils. They're all capable of an A star. He had the top group. <coughs> it's really unlikely they're all going to get an A star. I think it's likely a third of them will get an A star. But I've got no data on which to choose who should get an A star and who shouldn't. So in my predictions, in my forecast, I'm just going to do it randomly. <laughs> and that made sense to him <laughs> because he was trying to match his individual forecasting to a pattern that he'd identified from a, from a larger data set. Okay, most other teachers did not work in that way. They worked from the individual forwards. They don't work from the pattern backwards. Um, but that meant that they ended up submitting data to the data office that gave patterns that the data office was saying, well, that's not very likely. But what were teachers supposed to do with that information? They didn't have a way of, of, of working backwards and forwards between the pattern and the individual to make this make sense. Um, so when, when the patterns and the individuals come into contact, um, all sorts of problems arose. So what I think we're seeing here is various, conflicting, multiple, anticipatory data futures in which the school is producing, tracking, anticipating and intervening in education 
in different ways. And that this can be described as an anticipatory regime in which um, Vincan Adams and her colleagues describe this as a, a regime in which the present is governed at almost every scale as if the future is what matters most. So these data futures, these three multiple conflicting data futures can be seen as acting on the present, okay, shaping not just what is known, but what it's possible to know. Okay. And then in this, in this world, in this anticipatory regime, what matters most is optimizing pupils' data futures towards known or knowable futures. So we have an idea of what these pupils' futures could be and how they could be described by data. And, and the whole thrust of activity is trying to shape pupils' data and, and their futures towards these, these known futures that can be expressed through data and described through data. And, and again, I want to emphasize that I am not kind of saying, oh dear, this terrible school, what awful things they're doing, that this is an extremely rational approach by the school within the accountability system that they had to work within. So what I'm trying to say is some things become known and knowable and of course that means that other things become unknowable and invisible. So what kind of things are not being included within this anticipatory regime? So first and most obviously is the pupils' presence, who they are here and now, their needs, their interests, their wider engagements, what's important to them, who they are in the now. Systematically excluded was teachers' professional judgments. So bringing in, in their forecasting, all the other knowledge of the pupil about how that pupil might work, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what their struggles could be, and their relational understandings of pupils were excluded. They were exhorted continuously to base their judgments on data. And, and we've seen that pupils' achievement or interest in subjects other than English and maths um, were excluded from mattering and additional support for pupils who were not ever going to make an impact on accountability targets were excluded from mattering. And kind of more broadly from that, what is excluded is the opportunities for more critical and open futures that might come back to some of what Biesta was saying about allowing openness for new beginners and new beginnings. So where is the opportunity to critique these data futures? Uh, they're presented mm. as kind of a predicted inevitable, kind of thinking about Louisa Moore's work there. Um, where's the opportunity to say, well, actually, that's not the future that I want? Where's the opportunity to engage with the futures that we do want, that might be broader, that might be more open? And where's the opportunity to engage with the future, not as, again, a predicted inevitable to which we must address ourselves, but as a source of kind of multiple possibilities, as a source of new ways of being, of living, of knowing. These all seem to be closed down by these kind of rather narrow data futures. Um, so what people normally ask me at this point is, um, is uh, was there any resistance in the school? Did teachers resist this kind of data machine, this data apparatus? And, and the honest answer is no, they didn't really. Um, not that I saw. There may have been some. I didn't see everything that went on in the school. Some teachers took it really seriously. Some teachers used it as an opportunity for a career advancement. Some teachers um, kind of just thought, oh, well, we just have to tick these boxes, but it's not really important to me. But, but there was not really any direct opposition or resistance. Um, but I also want to kind of offer some alternatives to here's the data and we need to resist it and, and kind of think about whether there might be opportunities for doing data in different ways that are more open and more fluid and dynamic and that might allow us to approach data as 
less determining. So rather than saying, no, we don't want data at all, saying, well, are there ways that we can work with data that are more open-ended? So this image here is um, from a data visualization competition held by the Gene Golding Institute um, at the University of <coughs> Bristol. This is the winning, the winning visualization. And it shows, um, I'm going to have to read what it shows. Um, it shows, because it's quite, it's quite technical, it shows the spatial averages of quantities observed from more than a billion stars in our galaxy. Each of the three million pixels in these images aggregates observations from, on average, several hundred stars. Okay, so obviously this is nothing to do with education, but I'm offering this as, um, as an insight into the creative ways that we can work with big data that can be inspiring and that can be playful and that can be exploratory rather than determining and closing down opportunities uh, for new beginnings and new beginners. And I, I want to explore how we might work with data sets that allow us to see data as fluid and dynamic, that we could uh, deconstruct and recombine data in different ways um, to show different relationships through data, rather than seeing data as only telling us one thing, we can approach da large data sets as what are the multiple things that these data sets can tell us. Um, and how might we work with teachers and pupils uh, through participatory approaches and methods to, to open up um, new ways of working with data. Um, so that is where I'm going to end. Okay. Um, so thanks very much, Lindsay. It was really interesting. I really enjoyed it, and I have a hundred questions, but um, um, <coughs> maybe just one or one and a half. Uh, when you, when you said <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so when you said that uh, you know that there wasn't really real resistance mm. from the teachers that you know some they had different mm. strategies or like survival modes or whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, I, I'm also wondering what, um, if this is the effect of the time that you were already there, because there's this long history of this kind of competition and data, and probably the resistance times are almost over, mm -hmm. or the ones that um, had strong kind of resistance, motivations might have left schools by now. You know, so is there any potential even to resist this kind of, uh, practice if you are a teacher nowadays, you know, can you actually do it and survive in the system? Um, and then and then the second question, I quite like your invitation at the end to think alternatively about the possibility of numbers in a more creative and open way, but I'm a bit more of a pessimist in this mm. sense. What are, you know, are they realistic? So it, it, it seems that it's also a lot about the power struggle of different actors of what to do with numbers. So, you know, as you said at the beginning, mm. at the beginning, what gets measured, what gets enclosed, what's the power of it. So, there are many, I, I suppose, alternative, you know, numerous, countless possibilities. But mm. how how do they get a powerful champion, or at least the room enough to explore and experiment? Um, you know, so just the relationship between the agencies of power actors and different kind of practices that, that are enabled. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just a little question. <laughs> um, yeah, so so your first question about kind of, sort of where where has the resistance gone? Like I didn't see it, but was yeah. like could it could it even exist? Like, are there spaces where it where it could exist? Um, I think I think it would have been very hard in in the situation that I was looking at to resist. Data was highly political in the school. Um, parts that I I didn't really include in my in my PhD was. Uh, was a kind of, I'm trying to choose my words really carefully here, expanding the sphere of influence of 
data and the data office to not just pupils but to staff practices as well which again made it very hard for staff teachers to question because as soon as you questioned you were automatically kind of putting yourself outside where the kind of the, the gravity of power was in the school that the data office the physical space really surprised me that they had a whole office they had some really senior people working there having a lot of there was a lot of time and resource you know, and they were very influential throughout the school and beyond. And that really surprised me in 2015 when I did this field work. I later learned that this wasn't actually all that uncommon. Um, so it was it was tricky for people to openly resist. Is is it even theoretically possible? I think accountability structures have changed quite significantly in the last three four years and are slightly more fluid. I think that might, I haven't looked at this um, recently, that might allow not necessarily for resistance but for people to perhaps shape things a little bit more towards their own ideas and interests. I think one of the things, there is a generational thing, I think a lot of people who don't like this way of doing things have left education um, already. Uh, I think new teachers coming in don't question it because this is how how you do it or some new teachers at any rate um, and, and they can actually see opportunities for advancement through adopting these approaches that they can use the data to say you know well I've, I've worked this system and I've got the data to show that I need a promotion um, and so it becomes, you know, ingrained way of doing and being things. So I, I share your pessimism, to be honest, but I try to resist my own pessimism. Um, and, and I think my kind of invitation about can we do data differently is less at a kind of systemic political structure level and is more at a you know, how do we as researchers in this world avoid just kind of going, oh, it's, you know, we can't act. Um, so how do we kind of at least make the small interventions that we are able to show and continue showing that there are possibilities of doing things otherwise? And I, I think it's really important to hold on to that in the face of, in the face of pessimism and, and realism. Um, but I, I certainly don't want to be kind of Pollyanna-ish in kind of saying, oh yeah, you know, we can, you know, we can change all this, you know, if only we just, you know, try a bit harder or think a bit more differently. Um, can I just re add to that as well? Because it's not, it's the teachers also, isn't it, that are under a huge amount, mm. as you say, in the matter under huge amounts of pressure and monitoring in relation to this. I remember when I did my field work, which was probably 15 years ago, uh, and interviewing teachers and young people about the pressure of exams and all this kind of stuff and the monitoring. And, the, you know, the teachers was in one particular school were saying they were under what was at the time special measures. And they were saying, if we don't meet our targets this year, if we don't get this number of pupils through at GCSE at A to C, then will be closed and you know there was a yeah. huge amount of special on them and actually the school was closed it, yeah. you know uh, so so it's that layering of kind of monitoring and pressure isn't it but um my question was going to be much the same as the only second one really yeah. and i'd like to kind of follow it on about how what, what your views are about how we could do it differently because mm. in a sense opening up that question uh i think is a, a really important one to do but have you mm. got suggestions for that so I would like to I would like to try and do some cross disciplinary work actually and take people from data science and computer science and statistics and people from social science mm -hmm. and people from arts based backgrounds to work with pupils and teachers and to kind of say what data sets do you have mm -hmm. what data sets might we collect how and and to uh, approach that through a kind of participatory 
uh, methodology where we actually play and try and make data a little bit playful. So, and using the expertise of people who can rep represent things in interesting and different ways and then reinterpret and ask new questions and perhaps then seeing that as a kind of cyclical and dynamic process rather than a rather than the kind of traditional quantitative statistical social science where you have a question, you collect your data, you answer the data and there you go. Actually kind of seeing this as a more kind of cyclical and relational process where we explore the data to ask, in order to ask the questions <laughs> rather than in order to give us the answers. Um, can, you, can you give us an example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can't because um, I haven't really, because um, I haven't done it. <laughs> So um, this is kind of uh, sort of emergent ideas of um, of where this might go in a more productive in a more productive way. I suppose I mean what one I'm kind of thinking in the back of my mind, and I probably should have put more of this in, a kind of Evelyn Rupper and Mike Savage kind of approach to social life of data and talking about the kind of um, the dynamism of different data sets. Um, and how they kind of produce different realities and representations of the world, depending on whether you're kind of zooming in to kind of very close relationships or whether you're kind of zooming out to mm -hmm. kind of different different sorts of relationships with different sorts of data. I'm sorry, that is quite abstract, so it's quite hard to think of a um, of a specific example that that would make that more tangible. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> what I meant to say as well is that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, if, if something comes to me, I'll just, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we might have an online question and then we'll be careful. Okay, I, I just wanted to sort of really, more than ask a question, sort of share a couple of things that really, really worry me. Um, very slightly anecdotally, the sort of towards the beginning of your presentation, I was thinking with the pressure of teachers, it's no wonder so many we have these statistics as so many teachers leaving the profession. Mm. But my worry around that, I've got a second worry as well, I'm coming up with, but my worry about teachers is do we actually now have a generation of teachers coming through who are very compliant with the system and that, that sort of resistance isn't in there? And that worries me that teachers mm. maybe are just accepting and not questioning. My background's in teacher education, by the way. And so that's that. My other worry is actually about the learners themselves. And we're talking about shaping, we're talking about shaping learners' futures. Mm. What about those learners who aren't hitting the MEPs mm. and are not getting the support that they need? So we're, we're, we're shaping their potential achievement because they're not being prioritised. Absolutely. Absolutely, we are. Yeah. And and it's kind of scandalous when you see it so blatant. Um, but then you kind of also have to ask yourself, well, what is the school expected to do in that situation where they have very limited resources and the, the stakes, the accountability stakes are so high? Mm. Um, and I think this is a question of what becomes visible and invisible. And, and those, those are pupils who become invisible. Um, and also, I mean, I didn't want to unpick this here, but the kind of the interventions that they're offered you know, there was no interventions at the level of like, well, maybe we should try different teaching approaches. Maybe we should look at the curriculum. You know, the interventions was just, you know, hardcore revision, mm. you know, and more of it. That's scary. You know, yeah. so there wasn't, there wasn't a kind of reflective response to the data that said, you know, what does this tell us about our provision? There was a kind of, who do we need to target? Thank you. Um, no, it's a Rebecca question, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, yeah, you know, it's myself, yeah. um, I'm struck by this data room. Mm. I'm thinking about physical access to schools and mm. spaces in schools. And I was once on a what I was, PTA, it's not really called that, but anyway, we were, we were allowed into the staff room to have our meetings, and but we were told don't look at the walls and things like that. <laughs> you know, or the section of the wall. So I'm thinking, so if you have a, a physical space like that, 
you yeah. had control. Uh, who, especially, and when he mm. first said that, I thought, because I'm sure there's a photo of them in the wall, and they were yeah, photos in the wall. Yeah. But that's really yeah. personal information. Mm. Uh, if, if you're as a I think parent, GDPR is parent. kind of have a field day with them. No, I just wonder if it's pre-GDPR. I was curious about... Um, about that room. Yeah, I mean that was that was a really interesting element of the research is who comes in and what happens mm. in that room. And I I spent a week just sitting at that desk. That laptop is my laptop, um, and just kind of watching what was what was going on. Um, and pupils did come in because there were actually two teachers. Two of the staff who worked in the data office were also teachers. So sometimes they would have pupils come in to see them, and other members of staff would come in. And um, and the Raising Standards lead, Sarah, told me, you know, I think the word she used was, I would drag them in <laughs> to show them who they should be working on. So she would bring in teachers and kind of point them at the wall and say, you know, these are the ones you have to work on. So there, so there was a kind, there was a kind of performative element to the wall in that way, um, in kind of making very visible. Uh, and there was, I mean, there was a really interesting moment when a group of teenagers came in, kind of older, older children, and they were looking at their own photographs on that wall, and kind of in, yeah, and and it went in all sorts of odd ways. You know, firstly, these photographs are from year seven and hadn't been updated, so these teenagers were like, oh no, look at the state of me when I was eleven. <laughs> you know, why am I still represented in this way? Um, but then they were also like, oh no, I predicted a D, oh that's so awful, you know, and it was, so they're being encouraged to see themselves and their own futures and their own identities in these kind of very codified ways. I mean, it was, it was visible, it was, but it wasn't in the main corridor, so it wasn't, oh that's good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yes, I've, I've been thinking a lot about people's identity in relation to this and um, how they might feel about being so, so reduced and where was this data coming from. I'm sure you know that paper by Diane Ray, I'll be mm. nothing, but it seems like that has yeah. gone crazy. And so I, mean, I was very engaged in what you said. I thought that was a really, really interesting presentation. Okay. Questions. I, I've got a question about the leadership of the school. Right. Okay. Because your sort of power struggle you describe mm. between the data office and mm. some of the teachers. Mm. I mean, I've got the impression the data office had gone a bit maverick. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder what that brief was. It was like, at one point, if I heard the story right, yeah. you've got some teachers tr really trying to use the predicted grades as a sort of confidence boosting apparatus or a, yeah. a, or a kind of, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, or, or feeling unable to say, well, we're going to get a D and we still want to keep the possibility open. Mm. Whereas the data office really wanted the accurate prediction. So there's a real mm. values clash mm. right in the school there, isn't there? Really, yeah. and I wonder how that was being managed from the top, <laughs> yeah, if yeah. at all, and what the brief of the, yeah. the data people was. So I think, um, I think the data office set their own brief. <laughs> um, I think they, um, they had a slightly wider brief than perhaps the brief that they had been given from you know, the head teacher. They wanted, uh, they would use words uh, like systems thinking and efficiency uh, and, and really they wanted to bring, they, were, they didn't actually like the, being called the data office because they wanted their remit to be broader than that, um, that, that they, their remit was about pupil performance and standards. But they were expanding that remit to bring kind of problem solving, systems thinking approach to everything that went on in the school. Um, I, I don't want to kind of list all those things because some of those things were a bit sensitive and I didn't include them in my PhD for those reasons. So, um, but but they were they were in the process of of, of radically expanding their brief through being clever through being mathsy, um, through applying these particular kind of very sort of 
a rational and efficient kind of models to various problems that were that were going on in the school. Um, so there was there was a bit of a power struggle, and they they were systematically and explicitly engaged in um, in in a struggle over what counted as as knowledge mm. um, within the school. And and actually, the title of my PhD was a quote from the Raising Standards lead, which was, "Don't use professional judgment; use the actual number." Mm. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Anne-Marie, and then John, did you have a question? And I think I need to put it on the American Institute of Fashion Minutes. I found the talk happening when I was chair of government at a special school. We have to engage in data, mm. um, but data was a very different sort of person to read the mm. But I suppose I'm quite interested in that. You talk a lot about how the data team were mm. working with teachers and the teachers and the people, and it was all mm. very inward. Mm. And I wonder to what extent they were using that data, um, sharing it with governors, mm. and how that was operating, how governors and they may not be mm. in that process, and then also the whole Ofsted mm. arrangement. Because I think your idea earlier. Mm. I think it would be fascinating, but I do think that actually it's the inclusion of potential yeah. governors mm. within that process, mm. because mm. they have specific roles and remits around data, mm. you know, well, they all, they'll have to have a governor for data. Um, mm. But then similarly, the Ofsted and, and the way in which one is needed to challenge what is being mm. presented. So I suppose my, my, my question was a little bit about, did, the, did, did you get any sense from the school about how they were sharing that data, mm. using that data, with the yeah. external part yeah. around the accountability mm. element? Yeah, so governors mm. particularly. Yeah, so... so um, there was a bit of data massage going on um, to present the data positively to governors. You know, there was, so that was kind of, so a message might come in from the head teacher, governors are visiting tomorrow, can you give us, you know, a data overview? And, and then some work would happen to present that data uh, in a way that it would tell the narrative mm -hmm. that the school, you know, I mean, they, they weren't falsifying data, but they were, you know, selective in what and how it was presented. Um, it's, it's very interesting you say that because I, I was data governor uh, for a primary school, <laughs> um, and um, and that was part of what sparked my interest in this as a as a research project because I, I noticed how, despite all my own critical ideas about what data was doing in school, I was still. It, it was almost impossible for me not to play the role that was expected of me to sit down and go, why well, have you got this red here and what are you doing about it, you know, on, on the kind of data sheets. So, um, so yeah, governors were, I didn't, I didn't speak to any governors, but they were, their presence was felt, um, but they were kind of another accountability almost, mm -hmm. rather than kind of partners. Um, and then the Ofsted, the Ofsted was also a really strong presence, um, it, and it was super interesting actually because um, that analysis that I was telling you that they did in house, where they showed that pupils were really actually quite unlikely to make their minimum expected grades, um, the, the school had an Ofsted uh, just before I, well, kind of in between two phases of my fieldwork, um, uh, which, which was a good Ofsted, and part of the reason they got a good grade, they feel, is that they mounted a really strong statistical argument to Ofsted, and they actually bamboozled. Well, this is this is a story from the data office. Is that the data office, with all their clever maths wizardry, bamboozled the Ofsted inspectors, and they successfully argued that they shouldn't be held to account for three levels progress because it was statistically unlikely. You know, which is amazing that they did that successfully, when when actually it doesn't really matter whether whether that's you know what, what the basis of minimum expected grades has in reality. You know, that is still a national accountability measure, and 
you know, so, so, so it gave... Give in a way, that's an example of, of a yeah. different thought of, but it's called yeah. resistance to, yeah. and using the data in a way to, tr to challenge who, yeah. who, who is perceived as the people we're wanting to resist against. Yeah. Yeah, so so it's a kind of double facing thing, you know. So the the data office was kind of back to the teachers. You must get minimum expected grades. Out to Ofsted. How can you expect us to get minimum expected grades? Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was complicated. <laughs> so you have your question. Okay, I have a very simple yeah. one about how uh, aware of parents of this. And then <coughs> the second one is kind of much more about, I know, Caroline, you quite rightly were asking about the data, and what else mm. could you do with the data? Mm. But for me, I'd want to challenge the whole set of historical and political movements that have actually led where this is the outcome. You know, people are reduced to a sort of postcard and a mm. So I think it needs to be both. It's kind of both the looking at what the data is doing, but also the top-down policy of yeah. what is... Mm. And you know, accumulate where, the, where this is actually a rational thing to do, mm -hmm. where children have these numbers attached to them. But I, I also wonder about, sorry, more will come but the visibility of this, because it's always happening in schools, and we can remember that a long yeah. time ago, you know, doing my mock exams and then a predicted grade, mm. and that kind of thing. You know, I'm kind of trying to weigh up mm. why does it seem so much worse? Yeah. So it, that's the kind of question in there. That was three, actually. That was sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, were parents aware? Uh, to an extent, they had reports. Those reports had numbers attached to them. There, I, I didn't speak to parents in my research. I wanted to, didn't have time, couldn't couldn't access them. Um, so I can't say a huge amount about that. Um, but reports went home to parents. There's quite a lot of research suggesting that parents don't really know how to interpret these numbers and what they really mean and that they would actually rather have a narrative mm -hmm. um, but yeah so I can't I can't really say a huge amount on, okay. on that one um, and the kind of historical and political how did we how did we get here yeah. I think is what you're asking yeah. is kind of <laughs> I'm not asking you yeah, yeah. Kind of, yeah it's one way of seeing this is yeah. this is the result this yeah. is the trend yeah. Yeah. So I think one one explanation is kind of going back to um, going back to this kind of governing by numbers idea, mm. um, and I think there is something different in the present moment. I think I think that it has become a lot more intense and has become a lot more high stakes through kind of governing by numbers, um, and I think. Um, I'm thinking of um, something Gemma Moss wrote actually about um, uh, about the kind of Blair era of um, education policy um, and about how uh, the literacy hour and the numeracy hour, if people remember that, which was an extremely directive education policy, um, you know, specified to the minute what teachers should be doing, you know, in schools. And, and they really, you know, they made that their flagship and they, they had a target, you know, everything in the kind of new labour, you know, policy had a kind of measurable target assigned to it. And they missed that target and they got a lot of pushback um, for missing that target. And, and what, what Gemma Moss argues is that that was quite a significant policy failure that has meant that subsequent policy does not want to nail its colours to the mark quite so strongly. So it makes schools accountable through numbers. So you do it however you want to do it, but you bring us these numbers. So it's this, this kind of dispersed decentralised form of governance where, where schools are required to um, uh, meet certain data standards but there is less the government are not taking ownership or policy is not necessarily taking ownership for exactly what schools should do to get there. So it's kind of putting the responsibility more directly on schools but while also holding them ever more tightly to account. Yeah. Um, for for the numbers, but this, it means that a school can't turn around and say, "Well, I did what you told me to do." 
because the, the governance is through meeting standards rather than through performing particular functions. So I think that's one way of yeah, no, that's thinking great. about how we got here. Um, and yeah, what is new, what is worse? So there's a really brilliant book by Martin Lorne edited about the history of educational data, which kind of goes back into the 19th century. Um, you know, and so this is absolutely, you know, there's nothing new about, um, about data being collected, um, but I, th I think it is. I think it is new, and I think it is new because it's more intense. Mm. I think there's more data being collected. One of the English teachers, new NQT that I spoke to, he was he was laughing at how little data that the school has collected in previous years, and he said, "We used to only collect data four times a year, and now it's 24 times a year." <laughs> you know that we that we test our children. You know, mm. um, so so I think it has become a lot more intense. And I think that is partly related to, I would speculate really, that that is related to new discourses around kind of big data hype mm -hmm. and, uh, and accountability as well, that actually there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hype that through, that we can know things more precisely through data and that that means that we can control things more precisely. I think that's quite a popular kind of media tech discourse at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, right, very, very quickly, Carolyn. Well, I was prompted by Joe's really about the leadership and I was wondering how you fed back your mm -hmm. research to the school and, and how they responded to it. That's a very interesting question, um, which I can't <laughs> answer. <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, so, Things changed in the school while I was working there quite substantially and the school ended up withdrawing from the research. Okay. Uh -huh. so there, was some, there was some leadership changes and mm. they didn't want to participate anymore. Okay. And yeah. And I can't really go into detail. Okay. But, um, Sounds like a very interesting. <laughs> but we won't but, uh, yeah, so um, I Although I had intended to, I mm. didn't okay. back to them. Mm. So. Right, I think we should draw to a close, but thank you very much. Mm. It's really mm. Thank, thank you for having me. me.